Okay, I'm going to start. This is Joanne Jodke. Good morning, everyone. I'm responsible for business development and partnerships at Conservation Ontario. I hope everyone is doing well under these unprecedented times and keeping safe practices in your work and your home environment. So over the years at Conservation Ontario, we've been monitoring um, for potential opportunities for CAs in the carbon market. More recently, we were approached by the Eastern Ontario Model Forest and Blue Source about some opportunities that municipal community forests in Ontario and a CA or two are beginning to consider. This webinar provides an introduction and status of these opportunities in Ontario and some considerations for your own CA. I want to thank uh, Jim Hendry of Eastern Ontario Model Forest and Jamie McKinnon of Blue Source who will be presenting and fielding your questions today, as well as Emily Six of Blue Source for technical support and Astrid Nielsen, Executive Director of the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. Um, we'd like you to, um, there will be time for questions afterwards. So please send your, uh, your questions through the, as you think of them, through the chat box at the top right corner of your screen. And please also keep your phones and laptops muted through this presentation so that uh, everybody has a chance to hear what, what it's all about and um, participate in the question and answer period through chat. So that's all for now for me, and um, I'll follow up at the end, but uh, I hope you enjoy this. And um, now I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Jim and Jamie. Thanks, Joanne, and good morning, everyone. Uh, had a little difficulty there. Uh, so my name is Jim Hendry, and I'm the Forest Certification Coordinator for the Eastern Ontario Model Forest. And I'll start off the, the presentation this morning with a few slides talking about who are the who is the Eastern Ontario Model Forest, a bit about a forest certification program, and why we got involved uh, in the carbon offset program. So the Eastern Ontario Model Forest is a, a not-for-profit organization. It's been around since 1992, so that's 28 years. Uh, we're governed by a volunteer board of directors, uh, but we're membership and partnership driven organization in terms of setting our uh, goals and objectives. Our primary function or purpose is really to promote sustainable forest management practices. And we focus these efforts on uh, private land, uh, individual private woodlot owner and community forests. We have four main core business areas, and they are education and outreach, and that uh, business area is manifested by our annual Woodlock Conference, December forestry seminars, uh, forestry technical workshops that we offer throughout the year on a variety of topics. Uh, also included in that is First, First Nations cultural awareness workshops, and the list goes on. Uh, the second core area is our forest health network. Uh, this is an opportunity really for expertise within the forestry to share and uh, their knowledge and experience relative to forest health. And also we provide training opportunities to both, again, both private landowners and community forest uh, managers on um, anything from EAB, uh, Hemlock, Willie, Adelgid, Asian Longhorn people, and the list goes on. Our third area is forest certification. I'll tell, talk a little bit more about that in uh, the next couple of slides. Uh, but we've, uh, all that to say is we've been involved in that since uh, 1998 when we started to investigate uh, forest certification. And then finally, a, a new area of uh, our business is community forest carbon offset, which is really the objective of today's presentation. Um, a little bit about forest certification uh, within the Eastern Trail Model Forest. Uh, we achieved that group certification in 2002. And at that time, we had uh, 2,400 hectares under certification uh, and represented by 18 forest owners. Now, group certification, for those that are not familiar with that, uh, that really enables multiple forest owners of a variety of size sizes to come underneath one umbrella or one certificate 
and, and the model for it holds that certificate. The advantage of that is, for small and medium-sized boards, is that you share in the costs and you share in the benefits of certification without having to go on your own and, and, and do that. Um, the the force that are eligible for certification under the certificate is not just uh, in, in, in Eastern Ontario, it's but all uh, Eastern and Southern Ontario, um, and it's best defined as any forest within the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Forest region. So that includes Eastern and, and Southern Ontario. So it's, it's definitely the certification program is growing beyond the name of the Eastern Ontario Model Board. So where do we sit today? Well, you can see in the map, it's, it's, across, uh, uh, it's across Southern and Eastern Ontario. It's represented by approximately 75,000 hectares. Uh, 109 private woodlot owners, in community forests, three independent forest managers. Uh, we also have two commercial forest owners and uh, maple syrup, which is a non-timber product, uh, is also certified under our group certificate and we have five certified maple syrup producers. Um, one of the first questions we receive, uh, we get asked when we're talking to uh, interested landowners and community forests is really why certification. And the list is varied. It depends on, on the its importance in your forest, uh, to your forest managers, to your uh, um, board of directors, and, and how it's applicable. But we've heard a number of, of uh, reasons why. Um, and I just want to uh, expand on some of those. One is that certification provides a framework, um, almost like a template, you can say, for sustainable forest management. Uh, and that's also around not just the, the, the economic benefits, but also the social, environmental. Uh, there are a set of principles under certification uh, that you live under, uh, and the model forest is developed the procedures, the standard operating procedures to uh, assist in meeting those principles. So that's been a, 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 we've heard that loud and clear many times. Also from a community forest perspective, there's a high level of public acceptance when a forest is certified, and that's really centered around the fact that we have a third party auditor coming in once a year. And it's that audit that says that you're managing sustainably. Under the group certification, um, it's, it's supportable. We're sharing the costs and sharing the benefits. Uh, it's efficient and it's supportive. Uh, we also operate two certification working groups, one in the east and one in, and one in the southwest. Um, and that's really around listening to our, our members, sharing information, uh, and expanding and developing and, and fine tuning the certificate. Um, Certification also provides uh, definitely a meaningful and respectful uh, engagement with First Nations community uh, and also cultural awareness opportunities in a very uh, open and, and friendly environment. Uh, without a doubt, certification raises the industry standards. Um, we've seen that firsthand. Um, and then finally, uh, certification provides, and Jamie will touch on this later, uh, a, a market ready. Uh, carbon offset program the certification is a requirement uh, a baseline for entering the carbon market okay um, my uh, my last slide uh, in 2016 uh, we model fours uh, started to investigate the opportunities around uh, the carbon market um, and the reason why we did that was really two primary reasons. One is, uh, how can we uh, assist our partners in providing additional financial value to the certified community boards? So they are, they are certified, they're managing them well, um, and would carbon offsets provide additional financial resources to these uh, boards that are interested? Uh, the second reason is when enter a, a carbon market, they basically commit to sustainable forest management over the long term. 
um, and we feel that this provides for uh, helps ensures healthy ports for the future because you're now you're, you're committed to that. Um, so in early 2017, uh, we looked at uh, companies that were involved in this market. At the time, there were, there were five businesses, and we evaluated them based on four main areas: uh, experience in the market. 20 years, uh, expertise in the verification and, and, and marketing of carbon offsets, client services, and partnership innovation. So going through that list and undertaking that evaluation, uh, Blue Source really provides the highest level of, of uh, expertise and, and experience, also while providing a low financial risk uh, to potential community force that may be participating. On the topic of innovation, uh, we were impressed by the fact that Blue Source goals we felt were in line with the community for its owners, in that they were investing the upfront costs and they were managing the project to receive the highest uh, return for the, for the forest, for the benefit of both uh, of uh, At this point in time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Jamie. And he will uh, lead us through uh, the, his project on carbon offsets. I just want to say a uh, just a, a quick word about uh, about who Blue Source is. So uh, we're the oldest and, and largest uh, carbon offset developer in North America, and we've got over 200 projects uh, that are monetizing greenhouse gas reductions and. That represents about over 150 million tons of reductions, and and we are I mean, we're a private company, but we really have a dual objective of of um, you know obviously earn, earning paychecks, but also contributing to climate action to reduce over 500 million tons of reductions, and we're about 150 million tons uh, the way there. So, um, force carbon, which is the the subject of today's presentation, is is a particular area of expertise for us. Uh, we've got, this is probably a little bit out of date, um, we're probably about over 50 active forest carbon projects under management uh, and many more that uh, are uh, evaluating the opportunity uh, and uh, and hopefully we'll be pursuing it. And that represents over about a million acres of forest land enrolled in carbon projects. And I, I say that because it's, it's very relevant to the discussion today. This is not a ambiguous um, idea that you know may or may not uh, uh, materialize. This is a very real opportunity uh, that is leading to very real emissions reductions, very real monetary, um, well, financial revenues accruing to forest owners throughout North America. Um, and, and I think some of these numbers speak to that. Uh, and we, we, we do work in, in, uh, partnerships that, that tends to be very, uh, very fruitful And the Eastern Ontario model forest is, uh, is a partnership we're, we're very excited about in terms of the synergies that, uh, that we have, but, um, you know, south of the border, for example, we work with nature conservancy, Audubon society. Environmental Defense Fund and some um, timber investment management organizations uh, like Campbell Global and Forest Land Group. Okay, all right, on to the subject at uh, at hand here. So, one thing that will be evident in in this presentation is that we've got different market opportunities that uh, some of them are more present and viable today and some of them are perhaps a little bit um, dependent on some future milestones being hit to, to be able to be open. So, uh, you know, one question I get a lot from landowners uh, who are looking at this opportunity is, well, wh why look at it now? Uh, you know, if this is something that's continuously evolving and and you know, pricing and carbon markets should be going up. And uh, why should we not be, you know, looking at this when 
I guess, when this is all sort of uh, up and running and, and running smoothly? Well, I think the first answer to that is because of the necessity and urgency of climate mitigation. And using our forests to contribute to climate action, to sequester carbon, is our largest opportunity here in Canada, and certainly one of the largest globally. Uh, and so we really need to uh, make our forests work for us and not against us in um, in mitigating climate change. And and largely what we're going to be talking about today is, is how to do that uh, and how to be incentivized to do that. So this this graph here, this is North America wide, by the way, um, but it it does I mean, put into evidence the capacity of forests for climate mitigation relative to all of the other types of actions that uh, we can take um, related to land use and land use change. Okay. So whenever we talk about forest carbon opportunity, uh, these are this is an opportunity because there is a market. And of course, in any market, you have supply and demand. And so I'd like to break it down a little bit in that context uh, and first talk about demand. Demand is is absolutely key. Without demand, we have nobody to value and pay for carbon sequestration. And we have two principal types of markets that are relevant to the consideration by any conservation authority or municipality or landowner uh, or forested landowner uh, in, in Ontario and Canada for that matter. The first is the voluntary market. And this is a market that uh, is driven by principally large corporations, but not exclusively, uh, certainly governments, uh, political parties uh, um, are also engaged in this activity of buying offsets from reputable registries to reduce their carbon footprint, to go carbon neutral, or to offer carbon neutral products and services. Good example. If any of you, you know, taken an Air Canada or WestJet flight recently, and you've seen that, you know, when you're making your reservation, you can tick a box to offset the greenhouse gas footprint of your travel. Well, uh, the way Air Canada would provide that service is they would calculate the emissions associated with the travel of those who who clicked that, and that would aggregate into a, a volume of, you know, in tons of CO2. And then they will go into the market and they will buy voluntary offsets uh, to surrender against those, those emissions that they have committed to uh, neutralizing. And they'll do that through voluntary registries. So these are um there are a handful of registries that are operated by they tend to be operated by um by ngos uh, not for profit entities and they're ones that are are have a robust um process for determining the the integrity of these uh, emissions reductions and the offsets and so these would be things like the Climate Action Reserve and the Voluntary Carbon Standard and the American Carbon uh, Standard and the, um, the CSA. Now there is a greater variation in the pricing related to voluntary offsets. Uh, and the pricing very much depends on the 
the story that can be told around it uh, and the co-benefits related to the emission to, to the project. And luckily in this case, forest carbon offsets are the highest value voluntary offsets because, because of a number of things. That one, they certainly, that you can imagine that when Air Canada or when um, Maple Leaf Foods would be a good example of an entity that's that's gone carbon neutral. Um, when they're talking about their activities, they want to be able to point to the benefits that they're creating by these investments and carbon sequestration using our forests and how that protects lands and biodiversity and watersheds. Uh, that that people can relate more to that than carbon offsets from recovering landfill gas, for example. Uh, and so the the pricing, as you see in this the sort of reference of one to fourteen, um, for forest carbon projects, they're very much on the upper end of that that range. Okay, so let's go to compliance markets. Compliance markets are in Canada. Um, markets that are established by either provincial or federal policy and regulations. So in Ontario, uh, large industrial emitters are regulated by the federal government in what's referred to as the output-based pricing system. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but it's basically a system that was put in place when the Ontario government scrapped the cap and trade program that was in effect before. And what it does is it creates an obligation for large industry to achieve uh, certain greenhouse gas performance targets. And it allows them to comply with those performance targets by obviously reducing their own emissions but if they're unable to do that or unable to do it at a, a viable cost, they can purchase offsets in order to meet those obligations. And those offsets will be from emissions reductions that are done according to offset protocols approved by the regulator uh, that deal with emissions that are outside of that ind of those industrial sectors. Right? So they're in land use and they're in um, waste management and they're in forest uh, sequestration. So the interesting thing about the current environment is we have the demand from large industrial emitters accruing. We've had it accruing since Jan 1, 2019 to meet these performance targets and they will have their first requirements to report how they're meeting those requirements for 2019. Um, they'll have that first requirement by December of this year. And that creates a demand for offsets because offsets in these markets, and we have very well established markets that that really on, on which the this federal compliance market is, is based. Um, we've got We've got very good examples of how it works. And um, that includes an Alberta um, carbon pricing system that's been in place since 2007 and on which the federal system is based and California as well. And offsets are always your lowest cost compliance obligation. They trade at a discount to the alternative price that you can pay. And in the federal system, the carbon levy that you and I all pay when we go uh, and fill up our, our gas tanks, industry can pay that carbon levy as well to comply. And they will only buy offsets when it comes at a discount to that carbon levy and their own cost of reducing internally. And that carbon levy is at $30 today, and it goes up to 40 in 2021 and 50 in 2022. So offsets, will necessarily in this market trade at a discount to those prices. And that gives an incentive for industry to buy offsets. 
So that is the compliance market that's in effect today in, in Ontario. And that's replicated through, across Canada, either through the federal system that also applies in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick, or through provincial systems uh, that apply in British Columbia and Alberta and Quebec and Nova Scotia and others. Okay. So we've talked about the demand. Um, all right, I should say uh, the pricing right now in this market is unsure. And that's because we don't uh, yet have a supply of offsets into the system. That is coming uh, shortly, but uh, there are a couple of things that need to happen for that to be true. So we don't yet have a price of an offset in this federal system. What we do have is the Alberta system also has a $30 sort of alternative price and has a very well-established offset system. And the Alberta offset is trading at about $27 per ton. And so uh, you can expect that as very much the, the sort of value of a, an offset uh, created under this federal system or an offset created in Ontario. And then rising as that carbon levy price goes to 40 and $50 per ton. Okay. So let's talk about supply. Now, I did mention that there are some milestones, some some things that need to happen in order to actually create offsets. And by and large, that is the creation or adoption by, in this case, Environment Canada, who is the regulator of this federal system that applies in Ontario. You need to approve offset protocols. And offset protocols establish what type of reduction is eligible, how do you quantify it, uh, they establish measures for uh, monitoring, verification, reporting, um, as, as well as others. And so there are forest carbon offset protocols that exist in many markets like California um, that have existed in the past in British Columbia and are under development uh, to be adopted by the federal program. So we are waiting for those forest carbon offset protocols to really enable the opportunity to generate offsets under this federal program in Ontario. We have those offset protocols in the voluntary markets. So what, what do they say about the actual type? So forest carbon is a generic term and it really encompasses I think, three large uh, areas, although you could break each one of these down probably uh, further. First one would be afforestation and reforestation. Uh, and I think we all know what that means. It's tree planting in the case of afforestation on lands that for at least 10 years have not been forested and you're converting them back to forest and reforestation is regeneration of, of forests where they otherwise would not be uh, planted. Avoiding conversion. This is a relevant one for many landowners in, in Ontario. And it is where you can demonstrate the threat. And it's a pretty high standard for being able to demonstrate this, but where you can demonstrate the immediate threat of conversion of a forest to row crop agriculture or industrial or commercial development. And you instead decide to put a conservation easement to retain that as forest. You can still harvest. Um, if it's a sustainable yield, you can still undertake other activities, but it needs to be maintained as a forest. Then you're able to get credit for all of the carbon that is sequestered in that forest that would otherwise have been released to the atmosphere had it been converted. And due to the due to the threat of conversion that exists in southern Ontario in particular, uh, this is a very real uh, opportunity. Um, 
you know, it's an opportunity that you see a lot of woodlot owners who, um, you know, are looking at retiring and, and, you know, the next generation is unlikely to pick up where they left off and manage the forest. And it's, it's got a higher value for an alternative use and, uh, and it's likely to be converted. And, you know, when, uh, you know, when, when the owners retire, um, this is a, an interesting way to perhaps, you know, retain a legacy of that forest, uh, generate value uh, for that, that can compensate the landowner for foregoing uh, that, that other alternative. And the last one here is improved forest management. And this is the one that uh, we're gonna spend uh, most of our time here talking about. <clears throat> Okay, so improved forest management is, it, it can involve many different types of actions, you know, some of which might be things like extending rotation ages or reduced impact logging measures or um, curtailing harvesting, certainly. Uh, setting aside, you know, sort of conservation set asides, all these things can be actions that are taken under improved forest management, but they're not necessarily uh, the actions that any given, you know, landowner might take. The real concept of improved forest management is where you can demonstrate a that the common practice forestry in your in your eco region leads to more intensive forest management and you commit as a landowner to sustainable forest management then you can get credit for the difference in co2 sequestered in your forest between those two scenarios and so on this graph where you have tons of CO2 in your vertical axis and sort of years uh, on your horizontal axis, you see how the light blue, you know, triangles would represent a scenario where uh, you are undertaking common practice forestry in there, and that maybe that's diameter limit cutting. And uh, you are liquidating a lot of the merchantable timber off of the property and then um, letting it regenerate over, over many years. And that's what we would define as a baseline. In any offset project, you have a baseline, which is what you would do in the absence of the project, and then you have a project scenario, which is what you're committing to. So that baseline, is going to represent what common practice forestry looks like in your eco region. And that can be justified in many uh, different ways. And it will be more or less intensive depending on where you are, how close you are to uh, a mill, how commercially viable is your, is, um, or how merchantable is your, your timber. And then what you're committing to and what you need to commit to is sustainable forest management, whereby at the very least, you are harvesting less than annual growth. And preferably uh, harvesting, you know, considerably less than annual growth and obtaining uh, more value from the carbon sequestration by doing so. And you're making a very long-term commitment to that standard of sustainable forest management. Now, one of the interesting things about this is the, in the voluntary markets, that standard is largely set by, it's not that it's largely set, but it's largely represented by um, FSC or SFI, uh, but basically forest certification. If you are certified in these forests, you are necessarily 
you know, cutting less than annual growth and you are abiding by, uh, you know, other silvicultural practices that are that are very sustainable are going to lead to more carbon sequestered. And so many projects that we see are actually, you know, they may have been managing uh, their timberlands, uh, you know, according to, to a very sustainable standard for years or decades. And this is an opportunity that that really rewards them for doing so and incentivizes them to continue uh, that action over the long term. In other cases, it's going to be incentivizing new actions. And in, in most cases, actually, it will incentivize new actions because it's going to incentivize landowners to achieve a, a different balance. Right? Most landowners have revenues associated with timber harvesting, and there are a few others. Um, it's not the case for everybody, but what this forest carbon opportunity does is it values the carbon sequestration element and it changes the economics of managing your forest for its, for its resources uh, and will lead to more a different optimal outcome of timber harvesting, both in how it's practiced and it's and it's level. And that's that's a really great thing. It's a really great thing that we can provide other economic values to our forest uh, to complement in many ways the the value of the fiber uh, so that we can create more optimal outcomes both for the economic opportunities that timber harvesting offers and for climate action. The forest carbon projects or improved forest management projects uh, involve commercial harvesting operations in many, many cases where there is commercial harvesting and it is a sustainable yield and it is it necessarily has to be uh, certified. That's one of the criteria for these projects. And um, but it also involves conservation. And so I mentioned, you know, one entity we work a lot with would be the Nature Conservancy, uh, and they use these uh, this opportunity to really raise funds for more conservation uh, and to um, to fund their work in um, in conserving more areas that are under threat uh, to more intensive logging uh, and and all of the co-benefits that come with that. So it's a long way, a lot perhaps a long-winded approach to, to to say improved forest management can encompass many, many different actions uh, that we would all associate with sustainable forest management. The important thing is, is that they are not common practice. They are above common practice. And therefore you're gonna get credit for the difference between that common practice forestry and the sustainable forest management you're engaging in. Now, what that does mean is this is only a viable opportunity where you have commercial viability of intensive harvesting. And it's also only an opportunity where you have the legal ability to manage it more intensively. And for conservation authorities, for municipalities, which you know certainly are are different uh, from you know a regular uh, woodlot owner or other type of, of owner. Uh, it's really about um, incentivizing conservation authorities, municipalities to uh, continue to manage the uh, their force in that way to fund the management of that uh, forest in a sustainable way going forward and to ensure the very long term 
uh, manage that according to those same principles. I'll, I'll just give an anecdote right now about that, that sort of really puts that into perspective. We, uh, we work with um, a municipality uh, here in Ontario and uh, who is uh, undertaking an, an improved forest management project. And in helping them evaluate this opportunity, I did uh, many presentations to municipal council. And one of the, the principal barriers to this is that long-term commitment. Because in the case of a compliance project, you are committing to achieving this standard for over 100 years. And in the case of a voluntary project, it can vary according to the protocol, but it's usually about 40 years. That's a long time to encumber uh, the, the land. Now, it's an encumbrance that can oftentimes be, you know, the management of that land according to the way you're, you're doing it right now and, that, and the way you want to do it in the future. Uh, so it's, it, it can be quite assumable, but it's nevertheless an encumbrance. And the natural reaction is to say, well, if, how can I make that type of commitment for future generations and future um, municipal boards and, and so on? And the answer invariably comes in, well, uh, because you can generate a lot of revenue up front that can be reinvested back into the forest and the community. But in this case, in this, in this municipal council, as I, as I mentioned, this 100-year commitment that's required, and I was bracing myself for the sort of size and, uh, and you know, people uh, saying that's impossible, one councillor got up and said that when she had come to uh, the region that, that they're in back in the 70s, the forest cover was somewhere in the 70% range. And today it was less than 5%. And she loved the idea of putting in, you know, a hundred year commitment to managing this forest as forest and retaining it that way. And that the revenues could go into ensuring that that uh, was well financed to, to manage um, going forward. And I thought that was just a very interesting perspective that, that really hits on the, the nature of this opportunity. Uh, it's about uh, our force are under threat. Um, over a hundred year period, anything can happen. And the likely scenario is that those threats are going to lead to more intensive forest management. So undertaking this type of project does lead to net emissions reductions taken out of the atmosphere. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, there are likely a lot of questions with respect to that, but uh, we could probably spend all day going into the dynamic of this. I do want to talk about uh, a little bit more in detail the, the requirements. Because we're talking about, in many cases, very, you know, pretty substantial revenue opportunities associated with this. We have a, a fairly high price of carbon in this system. We also have a relatively low value of, of fiber in many parts. And the value of carbon competes very well uh, here in Canada with a value of fiber. That is not the case in, in many other markets, but it is here. And so what's important is this is not free money. Uh, this is not you know, money that's just going to be paid to landowners to continue to do uh, what they're already doing at no, at no cost, really. It, it should be viewed as a mechanism to incentivize la landowners to meet a very high standard of sustainable forest management. And if you're already meeting that standard, to continue to do so over the very long term. Um, and it will incentivize you to, uh, to undertake other practices that sequester more carbon and that build the resilience of your forest to natural disturbances. 
So it requires you, as I mentioned, in the case of voluntary projects, to make a 40-year commitment to uh, that sustainable, that standard of sustainable forest management. So that means retaining your forest certification. It means um, harvesting less than annual growth and harvesting less than a particular um, maximum harvest that you're committing to. And it means a pretty heavy um, monitoring and reporting obligation where you are doing um, annual desk verifications, which are pretty pretty easy, but then uh, you're getting on-site, you know, uh, third-party verifications or audits every five years. You're doing very detailed forest carbon inventories every 10 years. Because these projects are based off of going into the forest, measuring the biomass in your forest uh, with a, you know, an uncertainty level below 5%. So these are, these are very robust uh, forest inventories. And your, what you get as an offset is, is very much what is measured in your forest relative to that baseline. So the ongoing obligations for monitoring are, are very important. Now, it does provide you with the type of information uh, about your forest resource that is, is valuable for, for many other reasons. Okay, so we, we talked a little bit about, you know, the, the main restriction, if you want to call it that, under this protocol is to not exceed annual growth. And uh, that it achieves, um, you know, certification, in this case, FSC certification. That is going to lead to different optimums. Uh, as we spoke about in terms of uh, harvesting. There certainly are cases where landowners we work with are curtailing harvesting because they're getting more value through the carbon offsets they generate than the fiber they might sell to a pulp mill. Uh, but there are also cases where they're continuing with their forest management plan and, and then they're seeing how different actions uh, create uh, value uh, through one or, you know, through timber harvesting relative to forest carbon. And that might lead them to decisions about extending rotation ages uh, or um, like I said, reduced impact logging type practices. So what makes a good uh, improved forest management project? Uh, certainly the type of forest you have, uh, the you know, growth and yield of your forest is important in that the higher the, the growth, the, the more CO2 it sequesters over time and the more value from offsets. The, the management cycle. Um, so certainly managing a property for its long-term value uh, or for its conservation value uh, makes for an excellent project as opposed to managing the timberlands for you know, maximizing short-term cash flows. Forests of that type, and I know, you know uh, that is not the audience I'm speaking to today, but forests of that type are, are simply not eligible for this type of project. And size matters in this. Uh, there are pretty significant costs to doing those very detailed inventories, to hiring third-party verifiers. And so you need a certain size of forest to be able to cover those fixed costs. Now those fixed costs, in, in the case of when, when we do projects, it's blue source that is paying for those costs all up front. But they're nevertheless costs that uh, are paid back out of the value of the offsets and, and you need you need a scale to, to be able to do that. And in general, less than 3,000 acres is going to be extremely difficult. Now, there are efforts to try and aggregate uh, many smaller uh, land bases, uh, but those are those have, have proven to, to, well, they have not yet proven to be successful. What is important is you do not need contiguous a contiguous land base. What's more important is that you have 
scale that is within an eco region and that uh, is has the same ownership. And then in going through the forest carbon development process, the way it, it really works is um, you want to do a feasibility analysis and, and at Blue Source and, and in our partnership with the Eastern Ontario Model Forest, what we do is we help a, a landowner uh, assess the value. It's sort of like a feasibility uh, assessment uh, by modeling the, for the carbon that's sequestered in your forest, by modeling a baseline, calculating those differences, and providing uh, the landowner with a projection of you know a range of revenues, costs, um, a, a description of all the, the, the commitments that are made, uh, basically a document that would allow for an internal decision to to pursue this this uh, improved forest management or avoided conversion uh, project. And then once there's a decision to, to pursue an opportunity, and, and in this current market, that decision might not be definitive. Uh, many of our landowners were recommending that we we wait to see this protocol develop under the federal compliance market because the values in there are going to be higher. And so what we're doing is we're helping them prepare for that uh, by doing the feasibility assessment. But we'll be renewing that feasibility assessment once the final protocol is available in order to, to provide more, um, more certain numbers, if you will. But it really does pay to be prepared and to be able to hit the ground running in this as opposed to starting that whole process uh, you know once the protocol comes into effect because the rules in these in these programs tend to change a couple of years in and they get stricter and stricter and so those who are in it at the beginning have a have an advantage and we saw we've seen that in the current markets such as in California so we we do a lot of that preparing by contracting um, in this case, Blue Source is contracting with the landowner to to really do all the services related to the development of the offsets and, and sales and marketing of them. And then once you once you start uh, that project, you're then going in and doing the inventory. Uh, there's a great deal of documentation uh, that's put together. Um, we have a team of professional foresters who do this, and all that documentation is submitted to third party verifiers who verify that you meet the standard of the protocol in doing that inventory and justifying the, the baseline that you've determined. And then that goes to the, the registry, uh, either the voluntary or the compliance registry for another review process and then registration and issuance, issuance of the credits. And then those are sold and you're creating a commodity here. And that commodity is sold either in the voluntary market or in the compliance market um and and that's that's an important thing you're creating this commodity in, in the case of forest carbon projects that you can generate that for the first 30 years of a project and that's one of the very attractive things about this is that you're creating a long-term revenue stream as opposed to other you know actions that might be you know federal provincial grants that are subject to annual budgets and you're getting one off. Um, and those certainly are available for different types of measures. But I think one of the attractive things about a carbon offset, forest carbon offset project is you're reducing your reliance on you know, budgets and political cycles and uh, you are creating a commodity that has value in these, in these markets. Okay, so we have been, um, or I have certainly been going on for, for quite some time here, and uh, I usually like to make these things uh, quite a bit more interactive, uh, but uh, we do have you know, 54 participants, and, uh, and it's, it's hard to do that in this format. 
so we, we would like to leave it up to um, or uh, open it up to questions. Sorry, uh, at this point, and yeah, let's let's spend uh, the next um, half hour that we have uh, uh, for the uh, for the call in in talking about um, well, uh, really addressing your your questions. So hopefully, I am astute enough to see these questions come in through the chat. Okay. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sort of moderate these questions and, and direct them either at uh, Joanne or, or Jim uh, or answer them myself. Um, okay. Clearly the first ones are all about the problems hearing. So hopefully that has been uh, addressed. Okay, so we had a question about aggregation of properties. And you know, I'd made the comment how it's not, not been successful to date. And the question is how you know how how can you actually do that where you you might have a conservation authority uh, where the size of the forest is less than 3,000 acres and it, and it could be aggregated to achieve that scale needed. Well, the challenge in aggregating projects is the ability to make joint commitments to achieve that sort of maximum harvest and continue to, to retain that FSC certification. And what happens if one of the entities in that aggregation defaults on those commitments and it creates problems for the others in that aggregation? Because largely in these projects, you are making that long-term commitment to the voluntary registry or to the regulator to, to that. And if you were to cause a reversal of the carbon sequestered that you were given credit for as an offset, and you were to do that intentionally, then you would have to pay back those offsets. And so the challenge with aggregation is, is managing that when you've got uh, the impacts or the, the actions of one can have a, a serious financial impact on, on the others in that aggregation. That has been the challenge to date. And, and I think where you can, where you can make that work is where you're able to create a type of structure that can can manage those joint commitments. And we have seen that. Blue Source has a project uh, that is three municipalities, and municipalities of Holyoke, Westfield, and West Springfield in Massachusetts. And they did a, an aggregated or joint forest carbon project, improved forest management. That's created significant revenues. They actually sold it to Maple Leaf Foods. Uh, recently, who uh, who procured these offsets to meet their carbon neutrality commitments. Um, so it, it certainly can be done, uh, but it requires some innovative thinking around how do you create an, an entity that can assume those aggregate responsibilities. Hi, Jamie. It's Joanne here. Yes. Hi. Um, I was actually thinking that of that question too, and it, it has come up, and I don't have any... Um, what's the word, making any commitments here or anything like that. But as we learn more and, um, and those who wish to kind of investigate further on the aggregation piece, um, you know, I've heard Eastern Ontario Model Forest is interested in being an aggregator. Could it be Conservation Ontario engaging in some way to aggregate on behalf of CAs um, or a group of CAs, you know, regionally? So I don't have have any particular um, commitment to make here other than these are some different options and you mentioned some challenges of that as well. So we see this as a webinar for uh, to introduce the idea. We have a couple of CAs too who are um, further along and potentially having an agreement I think with Blue Source and I think the Model Forest but we can continue this discussion for sure. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. That's that's a great comment. And, and I think it's, 
we do need to make this work for smaller land bases. Um, they are actually the ones most under threat in many cases here in Ontario. Uh, and so for, for climate action alone, I think that's that's really important. So, uh, so thank you for that, that comment. And another thing I'll say is the, the partnership we have with East, you know, Blue Source and Eastern Ontario Model Forest is, is in many ways an informal aggregation. You know, the projects we are doing under there for different community forests are actually, they're going to be managed as individual projects for the, for the purposes of, of, you know, getting approvals and, but our partnership allows us to create economies of scale for managing all of those costs. So that if we're you know hiring third-party verifiers, if we're hiring forest inventories, we're able to do that over many projects, and that's bringing down the cost for each one. So we're very hopeful that within this partnership, uh, we're able to enable the opportunity for smaller forests that might not otherwise do it if they were just simply individual, you know, going it alone. But the need for more more formal aggregation is 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 absolutely there. Okay, so we have a another question here about uh, you know, how do we make a project more charismatic, um, and does this increase payments? So so charismatic is is obviously very subjective. And different buyers of voluntary offsets will consider different things charismatic. This is an this is something that's only really relevant to the voluntary markets. In compliance markets, large industrial emitters are buying an offset to comply with their regulatory requirements, and they historically have not really cared um, whether they come from forest carbon or something else. And so, no, they do not value or pay more for a forest carbon project than they would for any other type of offset in the compliance markets. In the voluntary markets, however, they very much do. And uh, forest carbon offsets, like I said, are trading at the very high end of that range of, you know, $1 to $14, uh, let's call it that. Um, whereas other offsets that, that don't have those same co-benefits are, are trading at the low end of that. So there's a very, a very significant premium for, for forest carbon because of, because of the story they can tell. It connects more with the audience that these corporate buyers are looking to connect with. People understand trees and forest more than they understand, you know, advanced refrigeration systems that back out high global warming potential refrigerants. Uh, but it's also the co-benefits that you're able to really talk about. And when we market projects, we're we're looking at all of these the sustainable development goals that are relevant, uh, whether it's First Nations reconciliation or watershed protection or you know, community development. And we're really highlighting those those benefits. And so the way you make a project more charismatic uh, is is by highlighting those co-benefits. And by making them relevant to the right buyers, you have certain buyers who, let's say they're a, a large beverage company uh, and they're part of the uh, Water Stewardship Alliance, then they're going to be a lot more interested in projects that uh, have significant benefits to the watershed. Maybe they're creating, you know, larger riparian buffer zones, uh, or the actions themselves are, are can can really go towards the, you know, the benefits uh, to water quality related to, um, you know, related to the sustainable forest management. Whereas you might have another entity that is building energy infrastructure and really values the First Nations reconciliation component. And they're looking for projects that that maybe have that benefit in terms of uh, 
involvement of First Nations communities. So uh, it's it's about marketing those co-benefits, if you will, to to the right audience as well. Uh, it's a question about will the presentation be shared? Absolutely, it will. So there's a, a clarification question here about, you know, are the carbon credits denominated uh, in, you know, a ton? Uh, and are they one time versus annual values? That, that's a really important clarification to, to make. So thank you for, for asking the question. Yes, uh, a carbon offset is denominated in one ton of CO2 equivalent. So it is one ton of CO2, in this case, absorbed by, you know, woody biomass uh, and, and the trees relative to that, that baseline, right? We're, we're talking about the difference between the project and the baseline. And it is a value that is, is measured in, in its volume of one ton, not necessarily on an annual basis. But when you do an improved forest management project, actually, let me, let me go back here to the slide. We'll, we'll visualize it a little better. You know, for every year, you've got a, a, a different, uh, a difference in the baseline in the project. You know, in this project, which is the, the project emissions, which is your, you know, your darker blue line here, you've got some harvesting going on. But every year in the baseline, you will have harvested more intensively. And so if you're calculating how much you sequestered over a year, you could choose to calculate how much you sequester over six months or over two years and that would generate a different volume. So it's not exactly an annual figure, but in general on the projects, what we do is we, we do these verifications for on an annual basis and we quantify the difference between the carbon that was actually sequestered in your forest versus what would have been sequestered in the forest had you undertaken that more intensive common practice forestry. And that will lead to X tons of CO2 as the difference. And that's what is credited. Hopefully, hopefully that, that answers the question. So there's another question of, is there a registry that would help connect offset seekers with potential offset providers? Um, yes. Uh, so the registries themselves, and as, as we mentioned, there are voluntary registries on which you, you register projects for the voluntary market, as we discussed. And then there are registries run by regulators for these compliance markets. In both cases, and each registry is a little different, but in, all, in, in almost all cases, the registry has a lot of information about the projects, about how many offsets are generated, uh, in what years, and what's been sold and what remains. So they are places you can go to, uh, you know, for example, if you're a buyer, to see what is actually available. Now they do not include any information about price, and they don't include any information about you know, for a given project on how they're looking to sell the offsets. Because in many of these projects, you know, it's not simply about, okay, I generate offsets and I sell them as I, as I produce them every year. Uh, if you're going to make this long-term commitment, you might want to see a certain amount of value, secure a certain amount of value upfront. So in a lot of our projects, we're actually contracting for the sale of the offsets 
for let's say the first four years, the first five years uh, at a certain price. And that's giving the landowner some security that, okay, I know that I can get this much value. Well, that, that's gonna make it worth the commitment. Um, and these are all things that we manage with the, 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 the landowners that we work with because we have the commercial capacity. We have commercial relationships with all the large buyers. So we create competitive processes for selling the offsets of um, you know that belong to the landowners, so that we're optimizing the value of that in the market. Um, and so the the registries don't give you that type of information, but they are places you can go to see what projects are available and what volumes are have been registered. And there's certainly places where your when you have a project that that information will be out there uh, for the market to see. There are no existing offset platforms where they're traded. Um, you know, like you would have a, an exchange for, you know, different commodities. Uh, so they're traded in, in the over the counter market is what we call it. So it's very much bilateral relationships. In the case of Blue Source, what we do with landowners is we manage that whole marketing and sales uh, on behalf of the landowners. Um, as I said, we're out creating competitive processes. There's a lot of contracting and uh, and trading that goes on, and buyers want to do that um, or often do that, you know, with Blue Source, who who they transact with all the time, and and we're managing that process so that it's not that burden isn't on the on the landowner. And we're incentivized to do that and, and obtain the highest price because our model is to do this on the basis of performance. So we fund all the upfront costs related to doing these inventories. And then we only get paid as a share of the net proceeds. So we're incentivized to, to maximize their value in the market. All right. What types of attributes are required in the forest inventory? So the, without going into a lot of detail, which uh, which is also beyond me, I would have to get our, our foresters to weigh in. These are, these are inventories where the specifications are defined by the protocol. So, we have protocols applicable throughout the US. We have protocol voluntary protocols applicable uh, to Canada. And it's going to specify uh, certain things. It's going to specify a level of uncertainty, which is usually at 5%. And then you need to do that inventory and design it in a way that ensures that you are you don't have a cumulative uncertainty greater than 5%. Because if you do, you're gonna to have to redo a very expensive inventory. And that's a lot of the of what we manage is we've done hundreds upon hundreds of these inventories and managed the verification of them. We have a methodology for doing that that ensures that we pass those third party verifications. But the attributes that you're looking for, they're gonna be all of your conventional ones in doing uh, fixed radius plot inventories. Plus, they're going to be uh, looking at um, particular defects that might impact the carbon sequestration on trees. Uh, you're going to be looking at standing and um, and fallen uh, trees. Uh, you're going to be looking at areas that define you know high conservation value uh areas um a whole suite of things that um it's probably 85 percent covered if you're doing you know forest inventories and you're doing fsc certification uh, and then has some additional requirements that that allow you to hit that five percent uncertainty threshold and and meet certain specifications but if you want more detail on that, I'm certainly happy to connect you with our, our foresters who can go into the details on that. Okay, is there an opportunity through land securement in Southern Ontario to take advantage of the avoidance and conservation practice for offsets? 
so I, I take it the question is related to conservation authorities or perhaps municipalities uh, securing land that was that was privately held, let's say, uh, uh, for the purpose of avoiding um, its conversion uh, or simply for to contribute to conservation objectives. So the answer would be yes, absolutely. And probably both within the context of improved forest management, as you add to that land base that you cover under an improved forest management project, there's going to be more value. But you would need to do that up front. An improved forest management project defines the land base up front. And you're not really able to add to it or subtract from it uh, at a later date. But through an avoided conversion project, it would be absolutely consistent to look at securing new lands that are under threat of conversion and financing the purchase of those lands by doing avoided conversion projects. One of the great things about that is you're getting credit for all of the carbon sequestered in that forest, not just the difference between the baseline and you know baseline harvesting and project harvesting because your baseline is that you would clear it. So they can be they can generate very significant revenues that could go towards funding an activity of securing more land that is conserved. So I think that's a very interesting prospect uh, in areas that have that significant threat of conversion. Okay, we have a question about um, how is a more hands-off approach to forest management viewed and improve forest management project type? You know, where especially in more sensitive forest communities where limited commercial harvest is being considered. You know, can you still generate value? So the answer is yes. Uh, but it's it is going to depend on, on on where you are. So and it's going to depend on the system. In the voluntary market right now, uh, that example I gave you before of those three cities in Massachusetts that, that got together and did this and sold offsets to voluntary offsets to Maple Leaf as, as, as one, one buyer. You know, they're, they're managing those, those forests for the benefit of their communities. Um, now, they don't have the same mandate as a conservation authority in Ontario, but it's not unsimilar in terms of uh, managing that resource for the continued benefit of the community. And they undertook this project in order to continue to fund those activities and, and ensure the long-term um, viability of that of that 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 forest management or sustainable forest management practice. But they're only able to do that because they can show that one, if they if they wanted to, legally they would be permitted to harvest more intensively. Even if the policy of the organization is not to do so, but legally they could. And two, it's commercially viable to do that as well, to harvest more intensively. There is a mill in, in sufficient proximity. They have merchantable timber that has value. Uh, and the common practice in that area is more intensive. They do need to show that. But the fact that um, a conservation authority or municipality might already have the, um, the internal policy to manage that sustainably, and they're doing that because of the sensitivities of the communities around them, that's not a barrier in and of itself to, to doing a forest carbon project. Okay, coming here, uh, we do have a question for Joanne. Um, 
John, I'm not sure if you can see this one, but basically um, uh, Ron Winter is asking, has Conservation Ontario or have other CAs clearly established that there are no legal legislative regulatory barriers to conservation authorities putting such long-term encumbrances on CA-owned land? That's certainly something to consider. Um, the question about um, are there any barriers to CAs? There is one CA who is uh, working on an agreement right now and has probably looked into this question. Um, so I'll leave it at that right now. Uh, we are getting close to the end of the webinar as well. Um, so if we don't get to all the questions before the end of this, we can certainly uh, follow up um, with answers to the questions, perhaps even set up um, another webinar as people think a little bit more about this and, and ways that uh, we could either collaborate as, as CAs collectively and or with Blue Source and uh, the Model Forest. Um, but I will uh, follow up on that one question that Ron has as well. Uh, anything else? Do, you want, do we want to continue or do we get cut off right at noon? Does anyone know? Emily, uh, I, I think we'll want to. I think we'll want to close it. Uh, you know, at the top of the hour, which is in five minutes. Yeah. Um, but there, are, there are a couple other questions. So, so let's let's sure. field a, a couple oh, more questions ahead. and then and then wrap it off. Okay. Um, so, question about uh, crown managed forests, uh, and can they benefit from carbon offsets? So. The answer is yes, they can. Uh, it is definitely more complex because you need to deal with, remember how I mentioned that you need to show that what you're doing uh, is not regulated, right? If you're required to do it by law, then you can't get credit for it as an offset. And clearly on Crown Forests, you know, here in Ontario, we have the Crown Forest Sustainability Act and any actions uh, that would give credit as an offset are going to have to be over and above the regulated standard in the Crown Forest Sustainability Act and, and other regulations. But in Canada, we have a very good example, the Great Bear Rainforest Carbon Offset Project uh, that is on Crown land. It involved conservation set-asides. It involved um, other types of protections, curtailment in certain areas. Uh, and uh, it generated value, significant value for uh, that that created a different balance between harvesting and and um, carbon sequestration. And so that that uh, is a good example of of this application on crown lands. Um, so the answer is yes, but it, it it's more complicated and it will require um, more specific uh, provisions in the protocol. Another question here, if, if lands are currently certified by UMF, is there a way to perform a pre-assessment for us to determine if it would qualify for Blue Source's carbon credit program? So uh, very quickly, it, it does not need to be currently certified by UMF to do that. Um, we are helping landowners uh, do these feasibility assessments, so we're not charging anything for them and there are no strings attached. Um, now there, it's a lot of modeling on our part, so we like to do it where there's a, you know, a real intention to sort of take a hard look at this opportunity, uh, and that's a that's something we'd love to discuss with with anybody who is interested. Um, but it, you don't need to be certified uh, by FSC three MF to already do that. Um, you would look at it now. One of the criteria, if you were to actually develop a project, would to become certified, but that's not something you need to to. Uh, you know, have while you're doing that sort of assessment. Okay. Um, I think uh, there are some questions coming in, but they're probably going to take uh, quite a bit longer to answer than uh, than the two minutes remaining. So uh, I, I suggest we do uh, sign off. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for, for joining the call. I want to thank uh, Joanne and the team at uh, Conservation Ontario for the opportunity to speak to uh, to all of you, um, both ourselves uh, and, and Eastern Ontario Model Forest are happy to follow up 
uh, with any any questions you have, any information, clearly any, uh, if you want to find out more, if you want to engage in, and, and do a sort of pre-feasibility assessment, uh, we we would love to, to help out on that. Um, we're very excited about this opportunity for for uh, community forests, but you know, owned by conservation authorities and municipalities in Ontario. I think it's a it's a fantastic way of creating value from a natural asset uh, that is very aligned with with what we need to do uh, as a country and province, but also aligned with a lot of the values I think that uh, the conservation authorities and municipalities already have. Um, so I, I think we'll leave it there. Um, I don't know, John, if you wanted to say any any uh, parting words. But uh, yep, just uh, thank you very much to both of you, the Model Forest Blue Source uh, Emily for the technical support, and then definitely um, it would be great to have um, potentially another webinar with some more follow up questions. Certainly, if anyone has any questions that might be common to all CAs it would be worth sharing the answers to those questions too to save some time and, and some build in some efficiencies. But um, look forward to following up and um, we'll leave it at that. Thanks for your participation and have a great day.